Welcome back to Book Club. Well, as some of you may have noticed, I have posted three videos already for Book Club. They're all going up at the same time. This is the fourth. And this is the one that uh, is about the readings. The other three were about Austin's environment, her world, um, Wiltshire, Bath. Another was about the literature she cited. Another was about the terms she used. So with this one, we're going to get back to our reading and talk about Northanger Abbey. So when we come back. through the first chapters of Northanger Abbey. Some of you have read ahead. It's a short book. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've read this. I want to start quoting um, Henry Tilney and saying hundreds and hundreds. And you know what? That may well be true. I may have read this more than a hundred times. I have known Catherine Moreland for a good 50 years, she and I have been buddies. Um, and I can actually quote lengthy passages of this book. And I always said that if I lived in the world of Fahrenheit 451, I would want to be Northanger Abbey. That would be my identity book of choice. Um, so, We've met Catherine Moreland. Now, because this was one of, well, it was um, Jane Austen's earliest foray into a full novel, although she did re-edit it at the end of her life. It was her first and her last in that sense, which makes it unusual. Um, it's, it's not anything I'm holding out as the perfect novel or even the finest of Austen's works. The finest of Austen's works is this little one, Persuasion. I know, you're thinking to yourself, not Pride and Prejudice. No, not Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice is probably her most popular work today. But Persuasion. If you talk to Austen scholars, they will say, persuasion easily um, because there's a sophistication to that book. It shows her as a mature writer. This shows her as a young writer, an exuberant writer, um, a, 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 a gay and happy writer. This is at the beginning of her adulthood. So that's one of the great things about this book, that youthful exuberance. So we've met Catherine Moreland, and we've just very quickly sort of glossed over her early life in Wiltshire. And Wiltshire, remember, Stonehenge. So Catherine Moreland has grown up in the shadow of Stonehenge, and we know that she's had a comfortable life. We know her father is a minister. We also know a few other things. Um, the perverseness of 40 surrounding families. There are 40 families in her village. Like, whoa. Like, 40 people. Well, more than 40 people, but 40 families. That's her world. Um, I find it hard to imagine, you know, 40, I'm, that's it. That's her universe, is 40 families. So she's had a very sheltered, restricted life. 
she's known nothing of the world. Uh, apparently, she's never even left the village until she goes to Bath. So, one of those 40 surrounding families, the Allens, has taken her to Bath. And so, we've gone from the little village to Bath, Disneyland. Bath is balls and assembly rooms and people and crowds and bustling and activity everywhere. And Bath was like this. For people would go from London to Bath for uh, the amenities there, uh, uh, the balls and the, and the uh, plays and so on and so forth. This was a very, very active place. So it would have been like Catherine had lived her life in a thimble and suddenly, you know, got dumped into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Totally different. People everywhere. Activities. Things to do. Um, things that surely she had never experienced before. you got to wonder how many concerts she had ever been to in her little village uh, of Fullerton. Uh, I can't think many. Had she ever even seen a play before? I can't believe that she had. World has just cracked wide open for her. And within our first 10 chapters, we've left, we've gone to Bath, and she has met Henry Tilney, and she's met his sister, and I don't believe she's actually, yes, yeah, she has met the general at this point. So she's met his family, and she has also met Isabella uh, and John Thorpe, their mother, their sisters. So she's meeting with characters that she's never been exposed to before. She has no concept of people like the Thorpes, John and Isabella. I love Isabella Thorpe, by the way. She is just, she's just this delightful little easel. She's, she is a social climber and a gold digger, and she has fixed herself on the Morelands because she believes them to be wealthy and important, and she's just going to dig her weaselly little claws in and attach herself to them. And she doesn't take kindly to Catherine's relationship with the Tilneys because it's a threat to her, to her plans she would like to marry James Moreland for his money. She would like Catherine to marry her brother John so that John can get Catherine's money. She wants Catherine to be her friend. She doesn't want to lose her to Eleanor Tilney. She doesn't want to, to see her brother lose Catherine to Henry Tilney. Uh, just delightful little creature. One of the great things about the book is the dialogue. Um, and it's not just because the dialogue is very witty, and that is largely wrapped up in our hero, Henry Tilney, who is, in my opinion, one of Austin's best heroes. Uh, he is clever, he is witty, he does not take himself or anyone around him very seriously. And uh, he's just a great hero for uh, a young, exuberant, um, youthful, enthusiastic author to come up with. He's just, he's great. But the dialogue is wonderful in other ways, too, because as we listen to the dialogue, which which I do when I read it, I read it in my head, I, I'm hearing it. As we are listening to the dialogue, we are seeing 
the contradictions, the inconsistencies in what the Thorps are saying and doing. They say one thing, they contradict it a moment later. Uh, there's just, it's all completely insincere. They babble forth whatever their minds. A moment later, whatever they feel they need to say at the moment to get whatever they want. So Isabella will say, well, I'm not going to dance until Catherine can dance because then we would be separated. Oh, I'm going to dance with you now, Catherine. You can find us out later. Just, just, and Austin, this is deliberate. This is, this is something Austin is putting out there so that we can see the hypocrisy, even though we see, too, that Catherine doesn't see it. Catherine is too sheltered to understand it. She has never encountered people like this. She doesn't know what to make of it. So when she's confronted with it, she takes them on face value again and again and again. And we are also beginning to see in our first uh, 10 chapters that Catherine is not just being influenced by her own lack of experience and naivete. She's also beginning to be influenced by her brother. And in the next 10 chapters, we're going to see that much more strongly. But that her brother is equally taken in by the Thorpes, but he is older than she is and he, he occasionally allies himself with the Thorpes. In other words, if they want something from Catherine, James is right there saying, well, you should do this, you should do this. You know, you never used to be, you know, uh, uh, unpersuadable. So we're starting to see that. And we're seeing that Catherine is endeavoring to assert herself, not just against uh, what I would say were the importunate uh, insistences of veritable strangers, but against her brother, too, that Catherine is trying very hard to, to follow her own moral compass in the face of a great deal of opposition. And by and large, she's pretty steady. So the things that I like about Catherine, uh, yes, I, I, I'm charmed by her naivete. Uh, and of course, Austin tells us that she's not pretty, she's not smart, she's not industrious, that none of the things that the great Gothic heroines were supposed to be but she does seem to have an abiding sense of right and wrong and a desire not to cause pain or inconvenience to the people around her. Ultimately, very good qualities in a human. Um, I would say that not desiring to cause pain or inconvenience to the people around you has its limits. There are points past which you just can't go. You can't just say, I'm going to dismantle my entire life because you know, doing what I want is going to cause you pain or inconvenience. But it does seem to be one of her motivations that she doesn't want to be difficult for the people around her. She wants to be obliging to the people around her but not so badly that she'll compromise her own sense of right and wrong to do it. So this makes Catherine ultimately the best of the heroines. The great Gothic heroines who are just oh, beautiful and they have um, the moral development of a fine angel and whatnot. No, no. Um, for me, Catherine is more of a heroine because she doesn't have this uh, terrific 
educational background that will support her. She doesn't have uh, a great sense of herself as a fine, beautiful, desirable woman. She's very insecure. She's very humble. Um, she, and well, a word that Austin would have used is diffident. She doesn't have confidence in herself. She doesn't believe that she is, by virtue of the fact that she's on this planet, entitled to anything. So, for me, that makes her a much greater heroine, because in spite of all of these deficits, she still struggles and eventually succeed in behaving in what she considers the right and proper way. So, as I say, for me, that is a heroine. Henry Tilney is a very good hero. Um, he, is, he is facetious. He can be condescending, to Catherine, he's, uh, he certainly is, he seems to be condescending to virtually everybody. He's condescending to Mrs. Allen. He's having a good laugh at the world around him, um, which is, that is inconsistent with what we today as modern Americans would view as the, the personality we would expect from a clergyman. But as I mentioned in one of the other videos, it was a job. A uh, clergyman was not considered to be especially holier or um, more good or righteous than anybody else on the planet. In 19th century England, it was a job. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a minister, and you know, it, it had the same sort of um, lack of uh, accompanying moral obligation as any of the other professions. It's just what you did. So that is interesting. Now Austin, having grown up as the daughter of a minister, and I believe one of her brothers was a minister, she would know this. She would know this better than we would because that was her life. For us, it's, it's a, a study. We are removed from the everyday reality of a life like that. For her, it was her life. So she saw the, the flaws and foibles of, of clergymen. And she never hesitates uh, to throw them out for observation. Um, and in fact, I'm immediately Mr. Elton from Emma comes to mind, who is rather disagreeable for a clergyman, and uh, Mr. Collins from Pride and Prejudice, again, well, he's not, he's just entirely disagreeable. Her clergymen are not necessarily good guys. They are not necessarily kind, um, uh, loving, forgiving people, desirous of helping the poor and downtrodden and making other people feel better about themselves and spreading the word of God. No. Not even close. And her clergymen are, well, I wouldn't go so far as to say they were villains because Austin really doesn't have villains in her works. But they are among her least likable characters and deliberately so. But with Henry Tilly, no, no, he's not unlikable. He is sarcastic. He is snarky. I love that. Um, he picks on Catherine and Eleanor for their grammar. Um, he, he's just, he's my kind of guy. So, do I think Catherine has chosen well? I do indeed. Um, and at this point, when we come to our cutoff point on the reading, which was chapter 10, when we come to that point, we have just begun to see this. We've seen uh, Henry Tilney uh, laughing and choking at a ball. Uh, oh, he is clearly at ease. Um, and we're seeing him 
as a, a very charming, delightful character, and uh, just as charming and delightful as Catherine has already given him credit for being. And we're also meeting with the villain, which is Henry's father. And uh, this is as close to a villain as we get. And he's not actually a villain. But again, with the dialogue, we see the contradictions. And that's one of the themes in Northanger Abbey that you will notice is that the undesirable people, the, the villains, if you will, are entirely inconsistent. They do not say what they mean. They do not mean what they say. Um, their words contradict their actions. And if there is an overarching sort of lesson to be taken from Northanger Abbey, I would say it is that dishonesty on that level, that, that sort of dissemblance, um, saying one thing, meaning another saying something one minute, doing something different the next, justifying both back and forth. Clearly, that is what she is holding up as the great um, uh, evil of personality. For her, that is the bad guy or the bad gal in the case of Isabella Thorpe. That the worst of human nature is that level of inconsistency and deceit. I got to agree with her. Uh, she was a very young girl when she sussed that out. I wish I had her sense of um, perspicacity. That could have saved myself a lot of trouble in the course of my life because it is at this point in my life where I'm looking at this and saying, yeah, Boy, she really summed it up. That's what you need to avoid in people. And what you need to look for in your friends is not necessarily that they're kind and sweet and polite to everybody. Isabella is. Henry Tilney is not. He is, he is snarky and condescending with people. But you need to look for honesty. You need to look for people who are putting their own personal reality out there and not pretending to be what they're not, um, you know, espousing one notion one minute and another the next. So that is my take on it. I really want to hear what all the rest of you have to say about it. And I am going to go and get the next giveaway uh, and we're going to take a look at that because, as I said, we've got three weeks worth of giveaways here. So, last week's giveaway piece was, My Cat Holds More Interesting Conversations Than Some People I Know. This is a magnet, and this was provided to us by Suzanne Urban. And uh, I will give you the information on her shop in a link as a pinned comment. And the reason I'm going to do it as a pinned comment is YouTube, when I put the links in video notes, YouTube sometimes really garbles them and then you can't connect with the link. So I found out from experience it's better to just pin them as a comment. So that one is over. The newest now is I am not a crazy cat lady. I am a lady who lives with crazy cats. And that is this week. And we've got a couple of pretty kitty bits here. All right. So if you want this, just let me know. You would like a cat pin. I will be choosing the winner from last week. I'm going to let you guys know next week which one it was. And then same with this uh, the winner of the pin or magnet, sorry, magnet this week. Uh, I will um, 
let you well this week you're going to have a week to get your your comments in then next week we have the third one the special one that's the one for Halloween and hopefully by the end of October everybody's going to get their goodies and we will have completed the giveaway meantime go check out Suzanne Urban's Etsy shop she's got some really cute stuff all right I will see you all next week. Meantime, we are going to continue with Northanger Abbey. We're going to do another 10 chapters. And um, and then I think the following week we'll probably finish it up. All right. Have fun. Enjoy. Again, this is Jane Austen. Enjoy the dialogue. That is really her strength. See you later.